So continuing on that same theme of practical Vedanta, I would like to talk about something which is a great casualty in our life, and it's called self-approval. Shall we bring that out, out of the carpet where it's hiding? Shall we do that? Okay. So, <clears throat> how can we ensure that we have self-approval? It's an ingredient in our day-to-day -day consciousness that cannot be objectified. It cannot be measured as such by a scale. Um, and it often also doesn't have anything to do with what others are thinking about us, because they may be thinking about us higher, right? But somehow we seem to have a very acute perception of how much self-approval we have or not, right? And it's only when the self-approval is of a lower quantity, quote-unquote quantity, we then seem to have this idea that if we get others' approval, we will bring it up. Would you agree? And then some of you here might be really experts in getting approval from others, but has it necessarily increased your self-approval? Yes or no? So it looms, it looks like these are two different lists. Does it not? So we should talk about the Vedantic approach to self-approval. Now, Vedant's goal is to set us free, right? Moksha means sakshaya of moha, or the end of all mind-based suffering. And if self-approval is a question mark or a not within our day-to-day -day thinking, then it binds us, does it not? It cages us. And we could walk into a room and be acutely aware of this quota or quotient of approval and feel very, very embarrassed because of it. Is it not? So it's a very painful aspect of our existence. It is definitely a product of our ego because it's only as we evolve in our age, when you are a two-year-old or a one-year-old, when you are a young child, you may ask your mom, mom, do you like my drawing or whatever, but the concept of the approval is not so huge, right? So a child is technically a little more free to be a child. Am I correct? But then as we increase in our age, and then as our the, the personality, the ego self matures, it starts calculating the quotient of approval that it has. And oftentimes, there is no idea how to have self-approval, and therefore, approval from others becomes a very important aspect of our existence. In fact, it takes center stage. So many people take up jobs or even choose the subjects in their graduate school for others' approval. So many people live a whole lifetime of a career for others' approval. So many people stay in marriages or relationships for the society's approval. Am I correct? So it's a very uh, important aspect of psychological suffering. And as a teacher of Vedanta to you, I would like to take a half hour of my class today to first talk to you about this approval business and really begin to understand how can you have self-approval so that the other approval is optional. Would you like that? It's optional. So if I may take you back to the class on Purusharta, do you remember? 
the four purusharthas are which one is the first one speak up artha which is related with existence survival um, going about the daily business to make sure that we have food on the table clothes on the body a roof to cover us whatever is required that's one legitimate goal and in fact we are asked to wake up and create artha which is the second goal karma what is karma dealing with pleasure we understand that human animal is a unique animal it also requires pleasure and so dance painting music theater comedy watching films it's not uh, banned in the vedantic way of living it's in fact if it can make you wholesome and <laughs> you know healthy then please indulge your kama purushartha which is the third one what does dharma mean anyone ethics another word duty okay so it is also understood that the human being is a um, highly sensitive and conscious animal and therefore whatever they like to do they like to do it ethically right and what is the fourth purushartha moksha what does moksha mean liberation from what from your own pursuits from the previous three right okay now we're talking good so the concept of approval is hidden in the concept of purushartha so you will say shunya ji keeps bringing up this topic of purushartha and i might be bringing it up 20 years from now also because each concept is interrelated and it's very deep so actually if earth deals with meeting your existential needs shall we call it existential to exist you need to meet them and they are important and mandatory and karma meets your refined sensibilities and that needs shall we call it that okay it includes sexual pleasure sensual pleasure uh, artistic pleasure hmm? then to further expand the concept of dharma it actually represents a way of pursuing the previous two there is no such thing as when you go to work you can say check artha purushartha check hmm? when you are making love or you are painting on a canvas or you are making a flower arrangement you can say kama purushartha check but what is dharma purushartha as such you know oh i run a not for profit that's a dharma purushartha perhaps but even even a not for profit includes artha kama right so dharma can be expanded to understand the human animal special human specific need to self actualize to do a job well to do it with such intelligence that it sparks and sparkles karma su kaushalam yoga lord krishna has said that your perfection in the work you do is a state of yoga perfection and who will judge that who will judge that perfection 
who will judge that when you were decorating your altar, you brought the freshest flowers, you decorated them in a symmetry. Have you done that? What joy it gives you? You cleaned up everything. You lit an incense. You created this perfect environment for Upasana Yoga. And as you're doing this perfection, this kaushalam, kaushalam means skill, dexterity. Give me more words. Tell me. Art, polish, and ultimately a state of actualization through what you are doing. So, the Dharma Purushartha is embedded within us. You know, these Purusharthas are embedded within us. And they are commanding you to actualize in your life. Whatever you do, whether you are a teacher of kindergartners, whether you are a mother and you are changing nappies, whether you are an Acharya teaching Tattva Bodh and other scriptures, whatever you are doing, whether you are meditating. So whatever you do, when you do it beautifully and perfectly, you fulfill the alignment with nature. It's a completion of an energy. Are you following me? So dharma has also been compared with another word called fulfillment. So a teacher like me who has, <coughs> I, I had a batch of students called the Bijas, and I taught them once and then the second year and then the third year. And at the end of their third year, I thought, mm, I looked at the portrait, this is missing. So I said, I'm ready to teach. Will you study again for a whole year? A whole year, will you come to class? And they said, yes. Again, they studied a whole year. They didn't ask a question why. They trusted their teacher. And they studied all over again. Now they are in the eighth year. And I recently told them, this, this little bit is missing. Can you come back to the clinic? Just sit quietly and just sit in the clinic. You'll know what you're missing. I might add another color. Nobody has questioned. They're all coming back. Now, that's one. That's a Shraddha. So we're not talking about the Shraddha topic. We'll bring it this up again when we talk about Shraddha. However, as a teacher, look at my perfectionism. Otherwise, here's a batch that comes, put the stamp, go. Okay? But what does it satisfy within me? It, that is what makes me a dharmic teacher. Because my job was to make a whole breed of health leaders. So I set out, a, I set out on a mission. Now this is between me and Ishwara. This is not between me and the Bijas. Are you following? So when I look within, I say, okay, this, this, this is missing, or this can be connected here, so this will get taken care. So internally, I do my housekeeping, and I say, now come back and do this. Are you following? So dharma is a kind of a perfection that comes from full surrender to the duty that comes to you. It is meeting every point. So for example, Another example from my own personal life, and it's an oft-repeated example of this little puppy, Labradoodle puppy, puppy, and his name, believe it or not, is Noddy. And we have Sanskritized it to call it Nandu. And he was going to spend time with us for three weeks while my nephew traveled. And then he developed all kinds of health issues, including a fracture of a paw, because he jumped from a dresser. He was a tiny puppy, and so it healed, but we had to put, you know, cast on him and do all kinds of things. Then he developed a rash. So nowadays, one of 
our daily job is to rub aloe vera on him to heal the rash. So we're doing what we can. So now it means the fourth month he's here. <coughs> now, my job as a dharmic human being is to ensure not only am I looking after his medical needs, food needs, play needs, safety needs, but I have to look deep inside and I have to say that am I begrudging any morsel of my affection, time, love and money that goes to Mr. Noddy, who karmically this soul has come into my life or is it like I have made a plate for uh, God and given to him? Are you following? So there's a constant vigilance that is required. Hence, Dharma requires a deep inner vigilance to look at our own attitudes, to look at our own um, work. Are we skipping it, skimping it? Are we creating some stories around it? Oh, call up the nephew to say, you know, my other dog is now diagnosed with terminal sickness. So hence, your dog has become a burden on us. So hence, take him today. Well, it's true. However, it's what it is. So we are, is life getting in the way from completing the dharma? So now what happens is when in a few weeks, this puppy will go home, and if it's meant to be, to his owner, whether the owner gives us a thank you card or not, whether the owner says thank you or not, whether the owner deserved this or not, what I and my family are doing towards this dog is really between us and Ishvara, me and my dharma. Hmm? And therefore, from this deep contentment arises an invisible experience of self-approval, self satisfaction. When I scan within and think about the bijas as a batch of students who trusted me when I didn't even have a business card, I have to know that I am in a state of dharma towards them. Are you following? I am doing what it takes. When it comes to this little puppy, who has chewed about everything in our house and, you know, just about, you know, what puppies are like. And I think Aparna, you had visited him and it was a very memorable visit. In my heart of my heart, I have to know that I did what it took towards this puppy, this soul. Now, so we encounter all kinds of expectations upon us in society. So while we are fulfilling our obligations, how are we fulfilling them? And are we bringing in a state of wanting a fulfillment, a completion, an actualization or not? And when we cut short, then what happens is we know. Oops. We may convince our somebody in our life, why we couldn't give them attention. But we in our life, we, the Atma knows where we are lying, where we have fallen short, where we, where we could have at least been truthful, if nothing else. Minimally, at least we could have been truthful. And when we hide behind social conventions or weaknesses or stories or we make them up to convince ourselves and then we do not perform what we have to do, what happens? There is a drop in self-approval. Am I making this up or does this feel familiar to you? Can I hear a jema if you agree? So therefore, uh, Self-approval is so internally connected to you and there is such a big barometer of dharma within you 
that when we act in an adharmic manner, an adharmic manner and we think, oh, adharmic manner is picking up a gun and shooting everybody in the school. No. Adharma can be moment to moment. Adharma can be that you're looking at your plants and they're dying for water and you didn't find the time to water them. Okay? Adharma can be that you had to speak the truth and you didn't say it because you care for an outer approval versus an inner approval. It's not easy to speak the truth and you have to find a way to write it, speak it, and take some risks. But ultimately, approval comes and when it comes and you actually grow a spine with it. And then the spiritual dharmic spine, it's called the dharma spine. When you have the dharma spine, then these are the people who walk alone. These are the people who become pioneers. These are the people who sleep like a baby at night. Because they may be misunderstood. There might be a whole volume of people against them, criticizing them. Because, you know, it's not possible to answer everyone and everything, right? But at the same time, there is this great inner conviction. That inner conviction is what not just the famous Gandhis and Buddhas and, you know, <laughs> Shankaracharyas and uh, Bade Baba and Baba we are going to quote. It's a day-to-day -day thing. You tell me now, you raise my hand, when you've really taken ownership of what you have to do, which is dharma, you are fully clean in your relationship with it. You really spend time with it. You tell me, if you are criticized, do you go into a corner or do you go into a quiet conviction, which is from self-approval? Hands? Yes? So self-approval is completely an inner thing, but self-approval is achieved a little bit through hard work. Motherhood takes hard work. Sisterhood takes hard work. Daughterhood takes hard work. Being a sevai takes hard work. Being a manager takes hard work. Being an acharya, hard work, which is equal to commitment. Which is equal to personal commitment, personal auditing, and personally looking at what it takes to be. So dharma is facing the situation. Dharma includes being totally, transparently truthful with ourselves and with the other. And as the self-approval starts building within us, gradually the other approval becomes a distant echo, a distant echo. You turn around and you hear some people applauding you, sending you some good email, some thank you cards, or not, or not. <laughs> but in this world of where Atma alone is Satyam, and everything apart from Atma is Mithya. That means Mithya is that which is dependent. And Atma is that which is independent. Then the way to lead this life is by knowing that even as you fulfill your Kama and Artha. Many people say, no, no, I am only Artha and Dharma, no Kama. Actually, every time we sleep, it is Kama. Every time we rest, it is Kama. Every time we pa pause, it is karma, it is pleasure, right? It is restfulness. And we are aware of it. So, bulk of our day goes in artha kama, artha kama, artha kama. Would you agree? Yeah. So, when I talk about ethics, what does it mean? Standalone ethics, what does it mean? It has no meaning. Ethics, when applied in the pursuit of artha and kama. Are you following? That means it makes you completely transparent in what you are doing. So therefore, a true student of this knowledge will never have to leave the work they are doing. So 
So I'm a nurse practitioner and I have to now stop being a nurse practitioner so that I can be spiritual has no meaning. It just means that you will become even a more self-approving, which is equal to committed, responsible, which is equal to dharmic nurse practitioner because you have the knowledge of Vedanta. Self-approval is critical. Without this self-approval, we are running on empty. Now, you can say, you know, self-approval, it's based on body image, it's based on how much you have, right? Or not have. Self-approval can be based on, uh, you know, do you have pimples on your face? Do you have a clear skin? I mean, it, it appears that Self-approval is that that um, is so sensitive to all of these things. If you look at the magazines today, and because I am I am somebody who has talked to people one on one and understand the human pain one on one. I haven't studied about the human suffering from books. I actually have people who 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 are in touch with me to relieve their suffering. I understand. I understand. I, I empathize that the body may be of not of that perfect image that you would like it, that society would like it, etc. However, if you have to begin somewhere, I mean, you would like to have a great body, you would like to work on Ayurveda with your skin, you would like to have, uh, you know, more manageable hair, or whatever is that, or more friends, or whatever are those parameters for more approval self-approval. Uh, you know, the Vedic sciences were so so rich that they never said poo-poo to that. They never said, oh, what's, what's wrong with you? Stop obsessing on your body. They didn't never said that. In fact, they created a whole pancham veda, a fifth veda just for the body. To shape sculpt it into the way you deserve it to be, the way you want it to be. After all, you are a resident spirit of a body. But, you know, to stick with Ayurveda also, I think there's a, one needs a dharmic spine. Don't you agree? One needs a dharmic spine. So therefore, even your commitment to the Ayurvedic lifestyle, eating, purification process, taking the herbs on time, on a regular basis, having shraddha with the Vedas, what if they say to you, eat this for three months in a row, eat it for three months in a row, etc., you actually need to pursue Ayurveda not just from a place of artha, existential, like survival, <laughs> like desperation. I like how I'm saying like, like, like. Sounding like my son. But from a place of complete commitment and responsibility and self-actualization in the sadhana of your health. You know this word self-actualization, why do only MBA graduates have to read about it? Why do only marketing professionals have to hear about self-actualization? Or why do only pyramid marketing scheme people have to talk about it? You know, self-actualize yourself by selling all these bottles in pyramid scheme. That is what I had heard once. I'm a very popular recruit. I, I, people love recruiting me. I have had many impromptu pyramid marketing schemes shown to me in most unexpected of places. So I must be giving subliminal messages that uh, I can sell. But what I like to sell is freedom. I don't like to sell a bottle. Otherwise I would have spent my whole life just developing an empire to sell products to you. You know, but what I'm selling you is, uh, I mean, the word sell, I'm, it's just a play of that word, but what I am sharing with you, what I am sharing with you is that I feel free and you can be free too. And so even the approach towards Ayurveda should not be flimsy and casual. And so we are being invited to bring an approach of dharma, to bring dharma, 
into our physical health. And say we ask you, you know, what is Vinay? Vinay is nothing but the employment of dharma in your, in your relationship with your teacher. You can have a relationship. The moment you enroll, sign an application, you have a relationship. But from a contractual relationship, does it turn into a dharmic relationship? Is then through sowing the seeds of commitment. Right? So do you bring dharma? And as you and do you bring it into your relationship with your body? You want a better body image, you want a better skin, you want a better hair, you want better relationships, you want better communication skills. Then the more you bring your attention to it, and the more you bring your ethical commitment to it, then taking those herbs on time becomes as important to you as anything else. Hmm? Just like, though I've had many batches of students, and many, many more students, it doesn't mean that I'm going to forget my first student. Because when you have a dharmic relationship. So it appears I have a dharmic relationship with a student, Samya, but actually the word dharmic in my relationship with Samya suddenly turns it not about Samya, between me and Ishwara. And she becomes a conduit for how I play this out. So your whole journey towards better body better health, better livelihood, better communication, it all becomes dharmic when you say, I'm a human being and I have come embedded with the seeds to not just just let, let your loser words and float. Tell me a few more words. Play here, play there. Do agriculture. How's that? One is you just throw the seeds, and the other is you do agriculture with your goal. Huh? Huh? How's that? Here is all this cauliflower of my physical health. I grew it with my own two hands. How's that? Yeah? You work that way. So, Self-approval is when, so there is something watching from within you. So the same mind, we will study further, there is a higher mind and a day-to-day -day mind. So the day-to-day -day mind gets caught up. The higher mind wants better. So when your own mind listens to your intellect, there is always a voice within you which knows better. Am I correct? Yeah? When you skip your yoga class, you knew better. When you didn't turn in your homework, you knew better. When you, whatever, you knew better. When you wrote, a, when you just kind of were not there in a relationship that needed you, you knew. So when there is a conflict within you, when you're at cross purposes, then there will be a drop in self-approval. And at that time, instead of looking inwards and saying, you know, I can pull up my own spiritual pants, we tend to say society has damaged me. Are you listening? Now, society is like a mob force to us Vedantins. It's like a force. It will do to you what you want it to be done to you. Please tell us what you want. You want to be a victim, we will victimize you. <laughs> you want to be adulated, we'll adulate you. Are you following? You want to be awake, then we will awaken for you. Are you following? So society is mithya, it has lesser power than you. I'm trying to take this whole approval equation back to you. And the society 
remarkably starts behaving itself when you start having more self-approval. Hands up, please. The same people change somewhat. They, they fight with you initially, but then they change in the way they interact with you from the way you interact within. So therefore, self-approval is an internal arithmetic. And if we are having particularly low self-approval, then there must be a habit that we may not have investigated from early on. And it feels like Vedant is saying, you're a loser, you don't bring dharma, you don't self-actualize. Hmm. No. But when I started internalizing the knowledge of my teacher, it required a huge responsibility to look at all the areas that were lacking. I don't know if that has happened to you. But if it has, then that's the beginning of ownership. We ask you not to be guilty. We ask you to say, it, it, you need to look at something before you can heal it. Even in an Ayurvedic model, you know, before you heal yourself, your doshas, you have to know which dosha is out of balance. See, then you can heal yourself. So only when we are able to truly, truly take action. Some of us may say, well, we'll meditate, we'll think, but I, nothing can come to me. There might be a state of feeling blank. There might be a state of numbness, numbness. There might even be a tendency to have created stories around how I've done what it needed to be done. But actually, if we go deeper and softer, and then we'll be able to see what I can do. So to give you a really difficult example, uh, a family member, not in my immediate family, but a family member who I had a good relationship with and who had a good relationship with a lot of us, suddenly went ballistic. Have you heard of family members flipping? Yeah. And the interaction has not been with me directly, but I heard about it from several family sources. You must have heard of the family, what is that? The vine? Yeah. The tree? So you hear about things. So this member had suddenly turned ballistic and was temperamental and moody and just being like, you know, difficult within the family uh, equation. So look at the range of my emotion. Oh, this is shock. Number two, how could they? You know, this is so this is so hurtful for this person to say all this to the other people he loves and and the others who depended on him. But then you go deeper, 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 deeper as I'm like moving towards this relationship. From a as for, so it's very easy to see he did that, okay? And he disturbed the family peace. Okay. But as we go deeper, 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 and you're like really being in a state of ethical, you know, observation and detachment. It's like, you know, what was not received by this person from the family that this person needed? Okay. Who is an aggressor? Who is a victim here? Is a question mark. And then ultimately, you hit that ocean of compassion and you say, you know what? If this person knew any better, you know, they would have expressed their need versus like reacted this way. So when I met with this person, I counseled him about speaking up and you know asking for what they need and instead my but this was my much thought of contemplated counseling versus my or original was like don't do this please so why did i bring this up i brought this up to explain to you how what appears to be something may not be that but we have preconceived ideas and we just run with them are you following me so I'm going to stop here, and I'm just going to take a rough check-in on your ideas around self-approval and other approval. Is that okay? All right. <laughs>